Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 16593 in the name of Christina McKelvey on progressing towards a fairer Scotland for disabled people. Can I say to those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak button now and I call on Christina McKelvey to speak to and move the motion. Minister, please. Presiding officer, it's my great pleasure to open this debate and I want to welcome to the gallery the number of disabled people who have joined us today and thank the BSL interpreters who are also here. I would like to start by noting the first sentence of the motion today and I quote that the parliament recognises the valuable contribution that disabled people make to Scottish society. We have this statement because people do not always recognise the value of disabled people in our society and I want us to move to a time where such a statement is unnecessary, where genuinely across all society it is recognised that the over one million disabled people in Scotland contribute to our communities and our lives, all bringing talent, energy, ability and adding rich richness to all of our lives. For too many disabled people, their ambitions, their dreams and achieving their promise is still denied to them because of the barriers society have put in the way. Inaccessible communication, low expectations, discrimination and inequality affect the lives and chances of disabled people every single day. But let's be clear, it's not the disabled person or their impairment that is the problem. The issue is the negative attitudes of those of us who are not disabled or limited expectations of our fellow citizens or careless ignorance and our toleration of discrimination, abuse and inequality that disabled people face. The barriers we continue to allow to stand in the way are the problem. Our homes, transport, workplaces, public services and our local environments are all too often designed or operate in ways that can exclude disabled people. Removing these barriers and achieving equality of opportunity is the change this government wants for Scotland and this must be a genuine transformation in our attitude and our approach. A Federal Scotland for Disabled People outlines five clear long-term ambitions and these are support services that meet people's, disabled people's needs, decent incomes and fairer working lives, places that are accessible to everyone, protected rights and active participation. The scale and extent of the change will, be, will take concerted action over this parliament and beyond. But these ambitions are all achievable and we remain as committed to them now as when we published this plan in 2016. We are committed to the principles contained within the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. One of those UN principles is the right to work. For most of us, having a job defines a large part of who we are. It reinforces our feeling of being part of society, gives us some degree of choice and security, facilitates independent living and affects our quality of life and those of our families. Disabled people are no different. They rightly want the chance to contribute their talents and skills through meaningful employment. They make a vital contribution to our economy, but too many are deprived of this opportunity. In our action plan, we set out our ambition to reduce the disability employment gap by at least half an ambitious target. In 2016, the employment rate between disabled gap, gap rate between disabled people and non-disabled people was 37.4%. This is a hugely ambitious target and one we quickly recognise would take time and nothing short of a fundamental shift in how disabled people are regarded in the labour market. Disabled people's organisations tell us getting the first opportunity to work is a barrier that can affect future work and life chances. So some of the changes we have implemented since 2016 have been about remo removing those barriers. An increase in the financial support for disabled people undertaking apprenticeships has seen a rise in the number of disabled participants, with nearly 3,000 starting a modern apprenticeship in 2017-18. An internship scheme across the public and third sectors, which is managed by Inclusion Scotland, is now being expanded to the private sector. And I have to say, I personally benefited from that internship scheme last year in my office. Many of those taking part have moved into permanent employment and as a result of this opportunity, have uh, realised some of their own personal goals. In fact, most of the actions set out in the, 2016, uh, in the 2016 plan on employment have now commenced or have been completed. 
However, after engaging with disabled people's organisations and disabled people themselves, it became clear that a fairer Scotland for disabled people was not ambitious enough. And I was at two events this week, the National Involvement Network and at the Kindness Conference this morning where they made that loud and clear. So we must go much further in changing the culture, attitudes and practice in employing disabled people. This is why my colleague Jamie Hepburn, the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills, launched a fairer Scotland for disabled people employment action plan just last December. The plan, which was developed in partnership with disabled stakeholders and disabled people's organisations, sets out our initial actions to take us towards meeting that target, which we aim to achieve by 2038. It has three key themes by partners, um, key themes highlighted by our partners, supporting employers, supporting disabled people into work and supporting young people to make successful transitions from school, which can be a key uh, time in their life. To be successful in implementing this plan, we believe that the Scottish Government must lead by example as both an employer and a policy maker. In spring, the Scottish Government will publish a recruitment and retention plan, setting a target for employment of disabled people in core Scottish Government roles. We will recognise other public sector organisations and encourage them to take part to and follow our example. As we will and, and we will continue to, to work across government to ensure the policies we develop to support disabled people help rather than hinder their ability to enter that meaningful uh, work that they all so much want. I now want to talk a wee bit about Social Security, Presiding Officer. Disabled people have a human right to Social Security and they should be supported to access the financial support they are entitled to. We are building a rights-based system of Social Security on, founded on the values of dignity, fairness and respect. Social security in Scotland is being co-designed with people who have the lived experience of trying to access the current benefit system to ensure it works for disabled people, not against them. This is a stark contrast to the UK government whose abolition of the independent living fund and welfare cuts have been judged by the UN as grave or systematic violation of disabled people's human rights. So by early 2021, Social Security Scotland will be welcoming new claims for the three main forms of disability assistance, the children and young people's working and working age people and older people, and doing so with dignity, fairness and respect as enshrined in the Social Security Charter. From April 2020, any family living in Scotland with a child who is in receipt of the higher rate component of disability assistance for children and young people will be eligible for winter heating assistance. In spring 2021, delivery of additional financial support to carers of more than one disabled child will begin, recognising the particular challenges impacting carers with, with such circumstances. Presiding officer, I want to talk about how the Scottish Government is working to help improve the lives of disabled people with learning disabilities. Last week, with my colleague Claire Hockey and COSLA, it was an absolute joy to launch uh, our exciting, refreshed framework in learning disabilities. It's called the Keys to Life. I'm hoping it's going to be the keys to success for many. At that event and at previous engagement... Yes, yeah, certainly. Jackie Bailey. Whilst I welcome the refreshed framework, would you not acknowledge that actually um, it's quite late in the day and the majority of recommendations in the Keys to Life will not actually be met? Minister. I have to say, and I know Jackie, Jackie Bailey's got a real commitment in all this, but I have to say the experience that I had with the National Involvement Network just the other day and at the launch last week, the people with learning disabilities were really keen to see the keys to life working and wanted to tell us how they seen it working. And we'll continue to do that to make sure that it does work. And I'm sure she will continuously be on my tail to make sure that happens too. At the event last week and at previous engagements, I met with individuals with learning disabilities who told me that they want and they need better lives. They were absolutely no doubt about that. The framework represents a journey involving people with learning disabilities at every single step alongside many organisations in the work we need to do. The framework takes a whole life approach involving both adults and children and is much wider than just health and social care which was a real issue that a lot of them had to talk to me about at the National Involvement Network the other day. It reflects our priorities on education, further education, employment, housing and transport. Added to that, the, the, the framework strongly recognises the role of relationships, including sexual relationships, the rights of girls and women over their reproductive health, and the need to protect people against gender-based violence. Individuals with learning disabilities, but particularly girls and women, are subject to many assumptions around their ability to have and sustain relationships and sexual relationships, their reproductive rights and their capacity to become parents. This just simply is a right. 
That framework is an exciting opportunity for us to collaborate and work together to make real change happen for those people with learning disabilities who asked us for that. We are also um, looking at how we uh, work uh, closer on um, accessible places. Um, and I I'm sure my colleague Kevin Stewart will be delighted to know that we now have, I think, 906 responses to the change in places consultation, which is absolutely wonderful. So we want to look at places that should be accessible for everyone. The Scottish Government is committed to continuing the provision of change in places toilets. And I see my friend and colleague Mary Fee nodding her head vigorously there, because I know her commitment to this is the same as, as mine. So currently we are consulting on that proposal to require change in place toilets to be uh, included in new larger building works through the building standard system. Changing places toilets enable those with ca complex care needs and their families to get out and about. Quite simply, it can be life-changing for many families. The consultation closes on the 13th of May, so there's still loads of time to encourage more people to take part, and let's see if we can break that thousand number. I was very uh, delighted recently to be able to support PAMIS, a charity which raises awareness of the needs of those with complex care needs, and enable them and their families to get out and about. It was great to announce some money, uh, because we don't often get a chance to announce uh, money, but we announced £45,000 to design and, design and purchase the equipment for a second mobile change in places toilet. This funding will enable more individuals and families to get out and experience what Scotland has to offer. But moving on to where we live, presiding officer, housing has been described as the cornerstone of independent living. Living in the right home with the right support can be the key to enabling people to live life independently at home. A Fair Scotland for Disabled People includes a commitment to ensure that each local authority sets a realistic target within its local housing strategy for the delivery of wheelchair accessible housing across all tenures and to report annually on progress. This was reaffirm reaffirmed in the programme for government and we will shortly issue guidance to local authorities requ requiring them to have all tenure wheelchair housing targets in place this year. We have also started working on our approach to housing supply beyond 2021 with many contributions from uh, our partners on that. Given the long lead-in times for housing delivery, we can't just build houses tomorrow, we are engaging with our partners to plan together how our homes and communities meet the needs of our changing communities by 2040 with, an op with options and choices to get there uh, as quickly as we can. Our shared goal, presiding officer, is nothing less than for all disabled people to have choice and control, dignity and freedom to live the life that they choose with the support they need to do so. The reason is simple. Equal rights for disabled people are about human rights. None of us can enjoy our human rights where even one of us doesn't. We are not standing still on this commitment, as you've heard. We will keep working with disabled people and their representative organisations, and we will continue to listen to the views of the UN as we undertake work in response to what we hear. We have high ambitions, presiding officer, for the changes we want to see, and disabled people have the right to know less. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Jeremy Balford to speak to and move Amendment S5M16593.1. Mr Balford, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I uh, thank the Minister and the Government for bringing forward this debate this afternoon? I think it's uh, timely and important. It's fair to say that we've seen significant improvements in the law to protect the rights of disabled people. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities the Equality Act and the United Kingdom Disability Discrimination Act have helped protect the rights of disabled people. At face value, we appear to have travelled far, but my conversations with disabled people and with disability organisations suggest that we are a long way from achieving equality. A report produced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission described disabled people in Scotland as being left behind and facing significant inequalities include a low attainment rate and higher unemployment. The Scottish Conservatives have supported the Scottish Government's delivery plan for disabled people from its launch, and we agree with the Scottish Government's stated ambitions for it. Like the Scottish Government, we want support services that promote independent living, meets needs, enable life choices, opportunities and participation, certainly. 
Alec Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Jeremy Balfour for giving way. Sarah Newton, the UK uh, Disabilities Minister, resigned two weeks ago and has not been replaced. It emerged yesterday that Theresa May is going to wait until after the Brexit impasse, whenever that may be, before appointing a su successor. Given that we all agree about the issues he describes, shouldn't he put pressure on his UK government to move faster than that? Before you respond, Mr Balfour, can I just have some time in hand for intervention so you get your time back? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, can I thank uh, the member for that? I mean, I, I think, first of all, I'd want to put on record uh, the good work that Sarah Newton did uh, across the UK. Uh, in my meetings with her, um, I think she really understood um, what the disabled community wanted uh, and was pushing a very uh, positive agenda. I mean, I do actually agree with the member. I think we do need a minister appointed as soon as possible. Um, and I'm certainly uh, hoping the Prime Minister will do that. Uh, and I'm sure we all want that to happen um, at the earliest possible moment. As I was saying, we disabled people want decent incomes, fair working lives. As one disabled lady said to me a few weeks ago, I just want a normal job, not a job that was created because I'm a disabled person. And I think that is key because perhaps historically we have gone off and created jobs for disabled people and we've only allowed disabled people to apply for them. But actually that misses the point. Disabled people want to be mainstream of universities, colleges, and daily life. We fully support accessible workplaces, homes, and transport. And we want society to do everything that it can to ensure that people with disabilities have full and active participation in all aspects of public life, free from stigma and discrimination. Can I gently suggest to the Scottish Government that drafting a plan is the easy bit the challenge is ensure that it is deliverable. At the heart of a delivery plan is an ambition that support services are designed and delivered to enable all disabled people to have control and live the life they choose. Self-directed support is at the core of this ambition and allows people, their carers, their families to make informed choices on what their support looks like and how it is delivered. Yet, at the SDS conference held in Stirling a couple of weeks ago, service users outlined issues around SDS payments and management. One service user described the process of working with his local authority to receive SDS as torturous. Another spoke of a good policy, but poorly implemented at a local level. Some felt the social work department weren't listening, while many felt there was a lack of awareness and understanding of a policy at all. If the SNP government is genuine when it refers to a real lived experience being the best guide for developing policy, an urgent review of the agreement between Scottish government and local authorities is required. Many disabled organisations are given increased priority to employment issues. Disabled people, like most of us, see the importance of work. And yet, as the Minister has already pointed out, one in five working age people in Scotland have a disability and they can contribute a wealth of talent, experience and views to the workforce, helping companies to grow and strengthening Scotland's economic performance. However, there are still many barriers. As we've heard again from the Minister, the employment gap stands at 35%. Over the last couple of years I've met with many business communities. I find an overwhelming support for the recruitment of disabled people. Employers see an opportunity to increase the pool of high calibre candidates within their business. We recognise that reflecting the delivery of the customers within the workforce can help in maintaining a long-term proposal that people buy in more readily ways. Again, I welcome the launch of the Scottish Government's Employment Action Plan and the input of disabled people and disability organisations into the development of a plan. Members will be aware that the UK government has also been looking into this area and published Improving Lives in 2017. I do hope, generally hope, that ministers in the Scottish Parliament will have discussions with the UK government on the potential for cooperation. As the Scottish Government's action plan acknowledges, the ambitions we have need us to work together public, private and third sectors with disabled people and organisations that represent them and communities. It will be key to achieving these objectives. I was pleased to learn that the Scottish Parliament is now a disability confident leader. Disability confident 
is a scheme run by the UK government that helps business think differently about disability and improve how they attract, recruit and retain disabled workers. By changing behaviours and cultures in their business, they can help to change attitudes across society. Disabled organisations believe there needs to be a better support provided for both disabled people looking for employment and for employers seeking to recruit disabled people. Discussions with business back up this view. The split in employment legislation between Westminster and the Scottish Government creates complexity. Employers refer to a crowded landscape where they can receive conflicting advice when looking for guidance. There is a wide support for a pragmatic one-stop portal where employees and employers can find advice on disability employment. And again, I would generally encourage ministers both north and south of the border to explore this idea further and hope that ideology won't get in the way of good practice. Disabled people must not be treated any less favourably than the other citizens. We must build a fair and inclusive society in which everyone has equal opportunities to thrive and succeed. To achieve this, we must put the rights of disabled people at the heart of our society. I urge the Scottish Government to continue to use its influence to work in partnership to reduce stigma and increase opportunity. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just thank those in the gallery who are attending today. I hope they find this debate helpful and I apologise to the signers if I've spoken too, song, uh, too long. With that, I move my amendment. Thank you very much. I now call Mark Griffin to speak to move amendment S5M16593.3. Mr Griffin, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'd also like to thank the President Officer and the Scottish Parliament body um, for again making the Parliament an exemplar in the provision of access to people who are deaf and who use British Sign Language. Today's debate is a, a useful reminder that more needs to be done to support Scotland's disabled people live their lives to the fullest, unrestricted by governments, employers, businesses, and in fact, society itself. With one in five people in Scotland living with a disability, that's more than a million people who are often left to the whims and attitudes of everyone else. And Though that experience will not be universal, many will suffer ignorance about the barriers they might face or are patronised. They will likely experience discrimination and worse still, they can face abuse because of their disability. So we should be clear that a person is not less or unable to do something because of their medical condition, nor are they less of a human being because of it. Indeed, it's because of society determining that someone who has a particular condition is unable to live their lives in the same way as a person without that condition. It's society that stigmatises someone with that long-term long condition. It's employers who put barriers in the way of their dream job. It's governments and by designing policies for disabled people, not with them, which means that their voices can often go unheard, their needs go unmet and ultimately can be left in poverty. And we'll be supporting the, the government motion today, although I would ask that uh, ministers respond directly to some of the, the criticism that was in the Scottish Independent Living Coalition, um, that that delivery plan doesn't fully reflect disabled people's lived experience or priorities for action, um, lacks ambition and a quote in many ways is simply a roundup of the pre-existing activities. But I know the minister is already very clear on that, loud and clear in her opening contribution about the, the demands and the ambitions um, that disabled people have for, for themselves and their um, action plan. But, President Officer, today's debate comes um, two weeks after Disabled Access Day and this year's access survey found that some of our ancient castles can in fact be more accessible than the, the local pub. And as our amendment points out, today people with a disability are twice as likely to report severe loneliness than the general population. The, the consequence of being excluded from the local pub, the community venue or a particular activity is that disabled people are prevented from the, living their fullest lives because it can be isolating and hindering participation and will have a, a wider impact on the health of a disabled, disabled person. And just, just a few weeks ago, we debated 
social isolation and loneliness and how disabled households are severely affected. The financial, emotional and practical pressures alongside the stigma and the lack of suitable services prevent families from being integrated, while low incomes can sometimes restrict their freedom to get out. When I saw the, the title for today's debate before we saw the motion, though, I had expected the debate to be about the government's consultation on disability assistance in Scotland. And statistics updated today confirmed that a household with a disabled person is twice as likely to be in poverty if it weren't for their disability benefits. And though uh, PIP, DLA and um, attendance allowance are not income replacement benefits, they are uh, benefits that are being devolved to this uh, parliament and published three weeks ago, the consultation set out how it intends to support 550,000 disabled people in Scotland with 2.4 billion pounds of assistance every year. That support does help with the extra costs and it does keep some disabled people above the poverty line. So it'd be good to hear perhaps from the cabinet secretary or the minister in closing, whether the government plan to bring a debate to um, chamber after the Easter recess to allow a, a wider debate in the chamber to then inform that consultation and raise awareness as the, the minister said in open remarks. Yep, happy to take an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Mark Griffin for the opportunity because as I'm not closing the debate to make clear, I'm more than happy to um, uh, I believe I'm going to the committee in a couple of weeks, uh, of which Mark Griffin is a member, to discuss this and also um, reinforce the, the invitation that I made to all the political parties to meet with me to discuss their views on Wave 2. I don't think as yet I've had a reply from the Labour Party on that, but I'm more than happy to do so as I have met and am meeting with other parties next week. Mark Griffin. Yep, I'm happy to come and meet with the Cabinet Secretary to discuss the Wave 2 um, benefits and glad for that invitation. Um, in the debate on social isolation, um, I asked the, the Minister to raise with the Cabinet Secretary the, the issue of extending mobility payments for older disabled people. And that's a move that's backed by a variety of third sector groups, including Marie Curie, um, CAS and Inclusion Scotland, because it would then help older people get out of their homes and live their, their fullest life. And it was backed overwhelmingly when people were asked in the consultation on social security in 2016. Gone, far gone are the days when older people disabled or not want to retire and be stuck at home, they want to get out. And the, the social security system should support them to do that. Um, I'm doubtful that the, the new Scottish legislation creating a benefit that discriminates on the basis of age would be permissible under the Fairer Scotland duty or complies with the non-discrimination principles in the Social Security Act. And I would ask uh, the government to reflect on that, that if we're truly building a social security system that is based on dignity and respect, that I hope we can assure disabled people that that system will help them get out, get into their communities to, to participate for the sake of their health, regardless of what age they are. Um, just briefly, President officer, we will be supporting the Conservative amendment this afternoon as well, but I do say gently that uh, cross-government work um, will only happen if there are a, a team of ministers in place to carry out that work. And I would urge the, the Conservative government to rethink that decision not to appoint a Minister for Disabilities until the Brexit crisis um, is over. But I move the amendment in my name, President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Griffin. I call on Andy Whiteman. Six minutes, please, Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. And um, I too welcome this debate on progressing towards a fairer Scotland for uh, disabled people and thank all those organisations who've provided briefings. And traditionally we, we, we say that, but uh, as a matter of routine, but the briefings for today have been uh, extremely helpful um, from the um, Scottish Independent Living Coalition, Citizens Advice Scotland, People First, Enable Scotland and Royal Blind. Um, I think the key to this debate is then the title progressing uh, towards, uh, as others have mentioned, um, progress has been made in Scotland's social security system and recent public attitude changes towards hidden disabilities in particular, but too many barriers both financially and socially still uh, persist. Disabled people, as we know, are more likely to live uh, in poverty, uh, face higher living costs, uh, on average around £630 a month. And today's figures on disability poverty um, are deeply uh, concerning. In 2015-18, uh, 
the poverty rate after housing costs for people in families with a disabled person is 24 per cent, around 440,000 people compared with 17 per cent in a family uh, without and up 30 per cent from the lowest recorded figure in 2009. And benefits like the disability living allowance, whilst are, they are meant to meet these additional costs, uh, the transition, transition from DLA to personal independence payment has been disastrous for many disabled uh, people. 56% of new claims are being turned down, 28% of reassessment claims are also refused, and those figures do not take into account the thousands of Scots that are awarded PIP at a much lower rate. These refused reassessments alone cost disabled Scots around £56 million uh, a year. And to be clear what this money uh, is for, it's for disabled people to live and experience a quality of life that everyone else takes for granted. And in cutting this support, the UK Government is attacking the rights of disabled Scots to live in dignity. Now, I welcome the Minister's commitment to work uh, with people with disabilities and the representative organisations to build a clear consensus around how the disability assistance should be assessed and how it should be worked, how, how it should work. Um, uh, and, is, uh, uh, and how, how, how we can all take that uh, vision forward with the increased funding, I think, that will no doubt be required. Disabled people as well continue to earn less than non-disabled people, compounding these problems in terms of working hours. Disabled women are much more likely to work part-time than disabled men. Women are much likely, more likely to be in underemployment and are more likely to be in low-paid jobs. 35% of disabled women are paid below the national living wage compared with 25% of non-disabled men and 29% of non-disabled uh, women. So despite the urgent need uh, for action, the target for achieving this ambition set out in the delivery plans by 2038 uh, and then only to have that gap uh, is, I think, uh, progress which is far too slow for far too many people. As well, the number... Happy to. Minister Jamie Hebben. I, I mean, I would readily concede that for an individual, we can't possibly move fast enough on this issue. And, uh, 20 years in the lifetime of any person on this planet, yes, is a long period of time. But would the member accept that at the most optimistic estimates that the current rate of progress would see 200 years being the period in time which we would at least half the disability employment gap? We are proposing to move at a period of time a tenth of that. Surely we accept that as a fairly ambitious thing to do. Before you respond, Minister, I understand why you turn sideways, but I think it could be quite hard for BSL to interpret that um, while you're away from the microphone. Uh, Andy Whiteman, please. Yes, well, I mean, 200 years is, is out of the picture. Um, an ambition of tenth of that is, is, is of course, at one reading uh, good. But I take what the member uh, says. This is going to be uh, difficult, uh, but as he rightly points out, for anyone experiencing uh, a disability, it is too slow. The number of disabled people on public boards has decreased in recent years, and there are, of course, very few politicians uh, with a disability. And this needs to be addressed for greater quality by all political parties in this parliament and in councils across the land. The minister mentioned appropriate housing, uh, and it, of course, is a barrier to allowing people the independence they deserved. And this needs to be tackled by ensuring, to begin with, that all new social housing is fully accessible, a topic that we've been scrutinising in the Local Government and Communities Committee as part of budget scrutiny, and an issue that was raised and highlighted by the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, more recently. Uh, and of course, such measures don't just benefit disabled people, they benefit uh, our ageing population uh, more generally, many of whom uh, will experience and be uh, the, the victims of uh, uh, mobility problems uh, in particular. And I welcome Mark Griffin's uh, the Labour Amendment in this context uh, and have been in, uh, uh, encouraged at the growing appreciation of the role of co-housing and other more appropriate housing options. However, the issues facing the day-to-day -day lives of disabled people stretch far below, beyond their homes uh, and their workplace. And many of the organisations that have sent briefings today have noted that practical support in their everyday lives is either lacking or not ideal, citing issues with accessible justice, parenting support and social care that support independent uh, living. So, Presiding Officer, uh, while some progress has been made, uh, and we recognise that, uh, and we welcome the Government's commitment on this topic, there is certainly a lot more to do. Far, far too many people today face real constraints and unacceptable barriers in their daily living, working and playing. 
towards, compared with those of us who take so much for granted. The delivery plan and employment plan start to address some of these issues, but in so much, as in so much more, we need more inclusive decision making and faster progress. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Whiteman. I call Alec Cole Hamilton. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the Government for uh, creating time for this debate today and indeed the tone that the Minister set at the top of the debate. This does command the support of the Liberal Democrat benches. Of course it does, as it should every uh, bench in this chamber. We have to strip the party politics out of this because it's been failing us. We have all collectively been failing in that shared endeavour to improve the lives of people with disabilities. We have made progress, but there's still lots to do. And the reality is that there has always been a disconnect between the goodwill uh, spoken in this, in this chamber and indeed our council chambers around the country and the reality of the lived experience of people with disabilities in this country. I worked as a policy officer in 2009 and I had to digest all of the 32 single outcome agreements, which is the local authority's roadmap for delivering on the national outcome framework. One metropolitan authority said that year it would endeavour to get 200 young people with a disability into employment by the end of that year. Reporting on that 12 months later, it revealed that it had only succeeded in getting 11 into work. That is the extent of the gulf between rhetoric and reality. And there are many reasons for that. We've heard a lot about the, the built environment that's still inaccessible, particularly in older cities like Edinburgh, in toilets, in um, accessible buildings. And our absence of a full strategy, which I've talked about uh, several times in this chamber, all of these compound the loneliness and isolation that people feel whose orbit of their social universe is uh, decreased by the realities, the physical realities of the spaces that they just cannot occupy. Underrepresentation in our society uh, of people with disabilities is rife. It's fair to say that. 7% of people with learning difficulties only will be in any kind of employment. In this chamber, we see a massive gulf between the chamber here and the society we seek to serve. We just don't reflect it in terms of the, the, the rich panoply of uh, mixed abilities in our society. And indeed on things like public boards, it was great that this parliament moved uh, mountains with its uh, uh, gender representation bill, but there still, I think, is a job of wor work to see people with disabilities and other equalities groups more effectively represented on the public boards that we appoint in this place. The UN Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities said that in Scotland, disabled people continue to be admitted from the key policy areas concerning them, and a range of policies, while positive in intent, were not adequately supported to deliver disabled people's rights in practice. That's not an assault on our government, that's an assault on all of us. That's something, a challenge that we should all heed, absolutely. And that's due in part to the fact that, really, from the first days of organised social policy, um, governments have had a slightly paternalistic approach to disability legislation and policy. And that comes from a well-meaning place, but it got it wrong. I think we were overly trying to protect people, not to empower them. And the absence of a place at their table meant that their voice was missing from the debate. Again, that's something that can be laid at the feet of all administrations that have served in government in this chamber and in the Scottish Government. And being heard matters. And if my amendment had been taken today, I would have spoken very much about that. Because the reality of public policy still denies, in some areas, both self-determination and agency. To make one's own decisions, to be heard in one's own voice, has to be at the fabric of our human rights approach to public policy. And we aren't getting that right. General comment on Article 12 of the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, reinforces the presumption that all persons with disabilities have full legal capacity and that perceived or actual deficits in mental capacity should not be used as a justification to deny or restrict legal capacity. That's really important. And one of the things they point to, and I, I raised this with the Mental Health Minister on the announcement of the review of the Mental Health Act, is that we are still in mental health tribunals over using curators when uh, those who sit in judgment of the mental health tribunals don't believe that it is possible to get the views of the person about who that uh, tribunal is being heard. We are over medicating in psychiatric wards to the point of incapacity where people cannot be heard in their own voice and we have still an insufficient use of independent advocacy. I, again, I do not ascribe party political um, blame on this. This is just a reality that I think we have an imperative as a chamber to work 
work together to solve. And I think the review of the Mental Health Act and indeed adults with incapacity legislation is an opportunity for us to work together to answer the challenges that the UN has, uh, has laid to us. Now, last week I had a great um, reception, some of you were at it, uh, for an organisation in Edinburgh called Get Together. Get Together are about adult self-determination. They are about recognising and myth-busting uh, the, the, the idea that adults with disabilities are adults with disabilities. They have the same interests and desires uh, and needs and, and they seek to provide that. And whether that's scotching myths about sexuality um, amongst people with learning difficulties or um, with, adult, with other kinds of disability or recognising that they want the independence to stay out late, come home drunk, find their own way home drunk. They do this, they foster an environment which supports that kind of social interaction which I think many people in political circles have often written disabled people off from having and I think I was very proud to host that it, I, it taught me some things it dispelled myths I had held and preconceptions I had held and showed just what an important ignition self-determination can do to transform lives perhaps very vulnerable lives and vi lives that have obviously faced challenges but can give them that spark of determination and self-sufficiency and we must do more to support them and organizations like them to close, presiding officer, we must give people in this country with disabilities a seat at our table, or they will have every right to continue to rage at us from the street. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, open debate speeches of six minutes, just a few minutes in hand for interventions, which reminds me that if you do intervene, your request to speak button goes off. So you must remember to press it again. I call George Adam to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Mr. Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I'm pleased to speak in this debate today because this debate means so much to me because disability is part of my life. Now, I feel a fraud by saying that because, it's, as you all know, it's my wife, Stacey, that has the disability. And until we were married, I was like many people uh, within Scotland who actually, the idea of access to buildings and services and for those living with disability, let alone employment, wasn't probably number one in my priorities. But seeing how Stacey's disability prog has progressed over the years of her marriage due to MS, multiple sclerosis, and all this has become a major priority for me. And it's funny when you look at this place in the parliament itself, we, we don't have anyone that's disabled as a member, elected member here. I do know my own sister was part of the government supported campaign that was elected in the Scottish uh, government. And, uh, Sorry. Yes, I'll take the intervention if Mr uh, Lyle will stop having a wee conversation. Mr Johnson. Thank you very much. I'd just like to e, give the member the opportunity to recognise uh, uh, Mr Balfour's presence, but also that many people have disabilities that might not be visible, and there may be, be other people in the chamber that do have disabilities. But finally, you shouldn't feel a fraud because he's living with a disability, and, and I think it's important and that we all talk about that, and I, I welcome his comments. George Adam. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was purely talking as Chief Whip for the Scottish Government and the SNP and our group in particular uh, because I was looking at it from the people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis and it's one of the things I was using an example of my sister uh, Jennifer who was part of the Scottish Government sponsored uh, campaign to get more elected members in the councils and Jennifer has a disability as well because she had a stroke when she was 25 and it left uh, uh, her with a disability. So we need to make sure that we work all parties mine especially, to make sure we're representative of the people in Scotland. And I've often asked, why should someone with a disability not get the support they need to access to work in particular? Because it's important we push these uh, boundaries. President officer, I'm going to tell you a personal story regarding an issue, and Stacey will probably kill me for it when I do leave this place. But after being an MSP for two years, uh, I came home after my, my working practices where I'd leave first thing in the morning, come home at 10.30. Stacey would be wanting to talk. I was ready for seven or eight hours' time, heading back to Edinburgh, coming back to Parliament, getting involved in work again, and wasn't worried. And I suggested during this discussion that became a Rami uh, that effectively we met in politics, so therefore you should be involved with me in Parliament. Now, Stacey has now been working here for seven years. So seven years later, she's still here and she now runs the parliamentary end of my, in my office. And she keeps me in check during parliament and ensure that I get where I need to go at the right time and I'm organised. 
And I have to accept that although Stacey is an important part of Team Paisley, she is not physically able to be here every day due to her uh, worsening uh, condition, and particularly with MS, it's fatigue in general. So I've got to understand that uh, she will have to have days where she's working from home and uh, having to can work that way. And for me, I think this is something that the private sector in particular needs to look at as well, having that flexibility uh, for people that have disabilities. But luckily here in the parliament, it is a good environment for someone with a disability. She loves working here and I'm not so sure her attitude working here is because of she's working with me but we're still married and seven years later uh, we're still working together but uh, I think the Scottish Government's ongoing work in this issue is particularly helpful a fairer Scotland for disabled people employment action plan sets out our government's commitment to disabled people in Scotland recognizing the valuable contribution people with disabilities make to Scottish society and Scotland as a whole. And for me, it goes further than that. Without the love and support of Stacey, I wouldn't probably be here. God only knows where I'd be without her. But this includes her work here in the Parliament, what she does and how she goes about her business with a smile and ensures that I are able to deliver for the people of Paisley. But she's a volunteer presiding officer and she keeps telling me I'm an unpaid volunteer. That's another argument that's for another day. But the Scottish Government's goal is for every one of the million disabled people in Scotland to have that choice, control, dignity and freedom to live the life they choose and support uh, they need to do it as disabled people make up 20% of our population. And I'd like to provide some examples of how difficult it is for those living with MS in the workplace, because uh, the all-party uh, Westminster parliamentary group had a report on it, which was employment uh, that works supporting people with MS in the workplace. And this report states that 30% of respondents who are currently in work said that they had experienced MS-related stigma and discrimination by colleagues or managers over the past five years. And the old party group also said that MS limited, they believed that the MS limited the range of hours and jobs because of their ongoing symptoms and fatigue in particular making it an issue. And this is part of the reason why Stacey as a volunteer ha has to be so flexible. We have to be flexible with Stacey in the office because sometimes she will need to work from home. But we now have the technology to be able to do that. And we need to ensure that businesses catch up with this and be, become aware of that pool of talent that can be part of their team. But I welcome the fact the Scottish Government want to work with employers because we need to establish best practice for disabled people with those with MS to access the workplace. Not just physical access, but access to the top positions that they can be, be more than capable to deal with. And this means we have to have a change of attitude by employers and in the workplace. They have to see through the disability. Like with MS Society has said, my MS, my needs, found that 39% of those working with MS 39% uh, were looking for work. And the other challenge we have is when they are in the workplace, 69% of those with MS in the workplace have relapsed and remitting MS. Now, if you're going to have relapsed and remitting MS, it's going to be easier. But if you've got secondary progressive, like Stacey, there's going to be difficulties. So, presiding officer, just to say that I welcome this debate and to make this work, we need to work with employers to see that their disability and accept the ability of the individuals. There are far too many people with MS in particular not getting these opportunities to be all they can be. And if I could say to employers one thing, it may be, appear difficult for them as employers, but it's our job and their job of, as employers to create the space and support for disabled people in Scotland. Thank you. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to be speaking in to debate today's uh, important debate and already I think from right across the chamber uh, we're hearing uh, very interesting contributions uh, and issues being raised. Uh, for my part uh, I would like to start uh, by saying it's not just disabled people or those with disabilities uh, who lose out as a result of discrimination, it's all of us uh, and uh, we are uh, disabled people and those with disabilities are not able to play their full part in society. society um, is, is weaker and I think that's especially true uh, for us here in Scotland in what is a relatively small country uh, we simply cannot afford uh, to miss out on the skills and talents and creativity of disabled people uh, and I see that very much in my own constituency where we struggle uh, often uh, to retain uh, people in the area uh, of, of working age and we need to make sure uh, that those uh, who are there 
uh, and do want to, to play their full part in society have the chance to do so. Um, I was particularly interested in what the Minister uh, had to say around uh, getting a first job and, and what a barrier uh, that can be. Um, that, that takes me um, on to education because um, I, I actually believe that's where uh, many of the problems uh, we see with employment and further down the line in our society uh, start. Um, it's, it's laudable and important uh, that we, we talk about having services uh, which provide human dignity uh, to disabled people. But the reality, and I think we have to be honest enough to admit it, is that this standard is frequently unmet uh, in early years in primary school, uh, for many in secondary, and on into uh, further and, and higher education. Uh, there are many young people right across Scotland uh, with additional support needs uh, who are not uh, getting the support uh, that they deserve. Um, I hear uh, from concerned parents uh, in my constituency all the time um, who see uh, their child's potential ebbing away um, as systems move too slowly uh, and, and we fail to see uh, support there. I believe particularly um, as this parliament takes on uh, more power over social security, it's vital uh, that we uh, focus on early intervention uh, to make sure uh, that uh, that people get the support at the earliest uh, possible stage and redouble um, our effort. Um, I've also heard uh, through my time on the Education Committee uh, testimony time and time again uh, that uh, young people and their families are unaware of their rights. Uh, we hear um, cases uh, where people uh, are being forced to fail in mainstream schools um, and they're not getting uh, the support they need uh, for what can be very complex needs and they're finding it more difficult yep daniel johnson I, th I thank the member for giving way and i wonder if you'd agree with me that that he found that some of the reports from the not included not involved uh report shocking and whether he would agree that that the uh, exclusion from school that many young people experience is, is illegal according to the law oliver mundell yeah, I, I would uh, go as far as shocking and probably further to say that it is a downright disgrace, presiding officer. Uh, I think Daniel Johnson is absolutely right uh, to, to, to doggedly raise uh, this, this issue uh, because absolutely no one uh, in this parliament can be satisfied that we are doing our duty when people are being unlawfully excluded uh, from school, denied their very basic uh, right to uh, education. And I am pleased that there are early signs uh, that the government are, are, are working uh, with the organisations who've brought forward uh, that report. However, uh, time is of the essence and it's easy to say we're on a journey and we're making progress and we've got targets. Uh, but it is remembering that fundamentally uh, for, for each individual young person, uh, they, they don't have the time uh, to wait. Uh, every day that we delay, uh, every day that we're uh, discussing ambitions for the future is, a, is an opportunity uh, missed uh, for them um, and I think that the government uh, needs to uh, put education uh, right at the heart uh, of its own goals and plans if it wants to uh, get anywhere near uh, meeting its target. The gap uh, between employment rates for those uh, who are disabled and those who are not um, I think is, is quite frankly uh, something that shames uh, our society uh, and should shame uh, all of us, uh, because I, I, I think uh, to get to, to this point with, with all the policy uh, ambitions and, 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 and statements that we have, um, and not to see that, that closing faster points to uh, the problem I, I'm uh, trying, to, trying to highlight. Um, and I think that there is this sort of postcode lottery across the country as well, and that's the other thing I, I, I would stress uh, to ministers. Uh, there is uh, good practice in some areas, uh, not so good in others and it's fine uh, up to a point to say it's for local authorities uh, to, to deliver education uh, and it's up to local authorities to decide how much uh, support uh, disabled people um, and disabled young people in their area need. However, none of us can believe uh, that it's possible that in some parts of the country um, the number of uh, pupils with AS ASN needs can be as low as 16%. Uh, yet in other parts of the country can be as high as 40%. Something's going wrong there. And at a national level, 
uh, we have a duty to do something about it. And if we want to see a fairer Scotland uh, for disabled people, uh, that needs to start from day one and support needs to be there to make sure people can fulfil their aspirations. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, Mr Mandela. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government and we as a parliament and a society must recognise the rich and valuable contribution that disabled people make to all aspects of public and private life. We also know there is still much work to be done in challenging inequality to ensure disabled people have full access to the social, civic and economic life of Scotland's communities. As we stand at the midway point of our delivery plan to 2021 for the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Pensions with, uh, Persons with Disabilities, it's only right to discuss progress thus far and what is still to be achieved. I thank Inclusion Scotland and others for their excellent briefings ahead of today's debate, highlighting areas where we need to move forward. For example, disabled people are still more likely to live in poverty than a non-disabled person. Uh, 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 indeed, on average, a disabled person in Scotland faces additional costs related to their impairment or condition of £632 a month. Sadly, there is also a real disability pay gap. These facts underline how important it is to reaffirm our commitment to delivering transformational change for disabled people. The Fairer Scotland for Disabled People delivery plan could not be more distinct from the UK Tory government's approach, which abolished the Independent Living Fund, cut employability programmes and welfare, such that the United Nations declared that there is evidence of, and I quote, grave or systematic, systematic violations of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, all in the name of austerity. Indeed, the Prime Minister was accused this very week of making disabled people her bottom priority after failing to replace the Minister for Disabled People, Sarah Newton MP, who quit on 13th of March. Meanwhile, official figures reveal that 70 per cent of disabled people facing the possibility of losing their entitlement to Social Security benefits and who then proceeded to a hearing had it subsequently overturned. It's simply unconscionable that so many people in need are being failed, raising questions about the number choosing not to proceed to a hearing because of the process involved who may have been successful. The punitive approach uh, is demonstrative of the UK government's often callous attitude towards disabled and vulnerable people. And many people born with disabilities so severe they are unable to work are still being subject to repeated employment and support allowance work capability assessments over many years, despite the fact that their condition is permanent. For one of my older constituents to be summoned for interview in air 22 miles from the southernmost part of my constituency is deeply stressful and pointless, a costly box-ticking exercise. In contrast, the SNP government believes that every single disabled person in Scotland has the right to choice, control, dignity and freedom to live their life with the support they need. Since two th Happy to take an intervention. Jeremy uh, thank, Balfour. Uh, thank you, Can I thank Mr Gibson? Uh, Mr Gibson will be aware, um, we had a debate last week, that uh, the concessional disabled pass, you have to renew it every three years. Um, and his constituent, who had that lifelong um, disability, will have to go again and again. Would you not recognise that? If it's demeaning to do that in regard to employment, the same would be true for the concessionary bus pass. And would you put pressure on this government to change the policy in regard to that? Kenneth Gibson. We refer Mr Balfour to the very um, uh, detailed response that he was given by Michael Martin, a cabinet secretary, a week ago today on that very question, as he will certainly recall. Uh, but since 2013, the SNP government has spent over £100 million a year protecting people from the worst aspects of Tory welfare cuts. This includes fully protecting households impacted by the bedroom tax, 80% of which have a disabled adult, setting up our own independent living fund to ensure disabled people would not be disadvantaged by Westminster cuts and going even further in opening the fund to new applicants. Of course, ensuring disabled people have an income they can live on is just one aspect of realising the human rights of Scotland's disabled people. The delivery plan sets out 93 actions to be taken forward by 2021 to help realise our long-term ambitions, including halving the employment gap for disabled people. Currently, the employment rate for disabled people is 42.8%, compared to 80.2% for non-disabled people. The gap is comparable to that of the UK as a whole, which, as uh, Andy Whiteman pointed out, will take 200 years to close if it continues along its current track. Fortunately, sorry, Jamie Hepburn pointed out, I should say, I apologise. Fortunately, here in Scotland, we are taking a proactive approach, including the award of 50.5 million to colleges to develop and deliver access and inclusion strategies, creating Fair Start Scotland last April, which provides support for disabled people to find work, and many more actions outlined in the A Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Employment Action Plan published last December. As employers ourselves, we MSPs can act too. Last month, I addressed an excellent workshop in Saul Coates about the Disability Confident Employer Scheme, 
and how we can better assist people with health issues returned to work after illness. From small steps like ensuring our constituency offices are fully accessible by installing a disabled toilet and access ramp, as I did when I first uh, opened my office in Dorai 12 years ago, to offering an interview to any disabled person who meets minimum job criteria, we can lead by example and become certified disability confident employers. As well as the individual advantage to the employed disabled person, utilising the talent they bring to our workforce and having the employment gap could boost Scotland's gross domestic product by 3.5% a year. Looking beyond employment, I was incredibly impressed by a recent Scottish Botcher training camp I attended, courtesy of Scottish Disability Sport in Largs. Some 350 para-athletes in tw 27 groups and teams across Scotland actively participate in Botcher, and it's now the fastest growing para-sport. I'm delighted that the Inverclyde National Sports Centre in Largs has, thanks to this government and its partners, facilities and accommodations specially designed for para-athletes to accommodate these training camps. This is just one example of how incorporating accessibility into the design of our public spaces and buildings can benefit disabled people and us all. Presiding Officer, Inclusion Scotland and other disabled persons organisations call for more input from disabled people in the design, delivery and evaluation of policies which affect them in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This states that parties should actively consult and involve disabled people and their representative organisations. This begins with such fundamentals as supplying documents in easy read format and ensuring meetings are inclusive and accessible. I trust the Scottish Government will take heed of these calls and going forward, disabled people and the organisations representing them are at the heart of the plans, delivery and evaluation. It is from the lived experience of disabled people we must draw effective solutions to the problems and barriers they face, central to achieving a delivery plan and tackling inequality. I am confident we will realise our ambitions for disabled people in Scotland, ensuring everyone has the opportunity to reach their full potential. May I give members notice that I may have to cut the length of the last speeches. Uh, Jackie Bailey to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Presiding officer, that's clearly bad timing on my part, but I do welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate. Judging from the briefings we've received prior to this afternoon's debate, I have to say I think disabled people are disappointed with the lack of progress made by the Scottish Government. Can I too acknowledge the work of Inclusion Scotland, Enable, People First, Scottish Independent Living Coalition and many, many others besides? And can I welcome Jim Elder Woodward to the public gallery this afternoon? I do welcome the government's commitment to a fair Scotland for disabled people, but I think it's fair to say that halfway through delivery of the plan, progress has been too slow. My genuine concern is that the government consistently overpromises and then under delivers. And I want to spend most of my time talking about learning disability and start by reminding members of the two learning disability strategies that successive governments have brought forward. The first was the same as you widely regarded as a seminal document that truly changed the experience of people with learning disabilities in Scotland. Gone were the long-stay institutions like Lennox Castle. Gone was the lack of dignity and respect afforded to people with learning disabilities. Care and support was to be pro provided at home or as near to home as possible and close to family and friends. Lives were truly transformed. This was followed a decade later by the keys to life, like the same as you, it's a good strategy. But where it disappoints is that it is largely undelivered. Lots of promises of action not fulfilled. A new delivery framework has just been launched, as the minister said, but there is little time left and the majority of recommendations from the strategy will simply not be achieved. One of the recommendations I want to highlight that was common to both strategies was to create a network of local area coordinators. At its best, this was a partnership between individuals, their families and service providers. Rather than having a maze of services to deal with, the local area coordinator was the glue. They were on your side, they helped you navigate a way through. Such was their value that they grew in number from five to 80 posts spread across two thirds of local authority areas. But unfortunately, funding cuts mean that many of the roles no longer exist or are delivered on a part-time basis. And yet the Keys to Life spoke at length about the importance of their role and promised a review to report by April 2014. That review never happened. Another example of over-promising over but under-delivering. Whether it's supporting independent living to enable choices, opportunities and participation, or ensuring that public services deliver a better experience for users with dignity and respect at their core, these posts 
contribute directly to the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, yet their worth is simply not appreciated. So you can have the most brilliant strategies and plans, but if they are left gathering dust on a shelf in St Andrew's house, they have little impact on the experience of people with disabilities. And we absolutely, therefore, need to renew our focus on implementation. The Coming Home Report by Dr Macdonald, published a month ago, was a very welcome but a very concerning piece of work. 700 people with learning disabilities were being cared for away from home, in the majority of cases against their wishes. If we are to deliver a fairer Scotland for disabled people, implementing the Coming Home Report must be a priority. But of course, we shouldn't just think about disabled people in terms of their care. For all of us, it's about where you live, your ability to work, to be financially stable, to have strong social networks, in short, to live a full life. Often, that's based on individual circumstances, on local decisions, but central government does have an overarching role and should be at the forefront of leading change. The Fair Scotland for Disabled People Plan adopts the social model of disability, and as the Minister rightly said, this recognises that it is a society that disables people and we should act to remove those barriers. But you know, there is a long, long way to go. The Scottish Government has left disability benefits, surprisingly in my view, in the hands of the Tories until at least 2024, handing back control to the UK Government so we are unable to make changes that I think people are crying out for. There is a housing crisis for disabled people the number of ASN teachers is being slashed. And as council budgets are stretched to breaking point, self-directed support becomes much more elusive to get. And the cuts and increased social care charges faced by many people with disabilities is truly worrying because we are turning the clock back. And whilst talking about local government, presiding officer, let me mention the living wage for overnight care. If we want a sustainable social care infrastructure which provides good quality care and enables self-directed support, then we need to value and reward the workforce. Now, I welcome the government's fair work agenda. I welcome the strong view from the Cabinet Secretary for Health that all local authorities, not just a few, should provide the living wage for all Commission services, not just for daytime hours, but for overnight working as well. But not every local authority has signed up to do this, despite receiving resources from the Scottish Government. And that's simply not good enough. The Scottish Government must ensure that this changes now. With this, as with the overall Fairer Scotland for Disabled People plan, I say to the Minister, don't tell me what's important to you, although warm words are nice, but they don't change people's lives. Real action backed by resources, can be transformational. I commend that approach to the Minister. Mark Macdonald, followed by Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And like George Adam earlier, I'm uh, a member in this chamber who, uh, <coughs> whose life is affected substantially by disability, albeit not my own, um, as I'm a parent of a disabled child. Um, and in that respect, um, many of the families and individuals who I come into contact with on a regular basis uh, also have their lives uh, touched by disability. And so I want to reflect some of the, the issues that they've highlighted, as well as some that have been highlighted by some of the organisations who've contacted members in advance of today's debate. And I want to talk broadly in terms uh, of accessibility, because I think it is uh, a term that applies very broadly uh, in relation um, to the debate around disability. Uh, I, I think it has to start right back at the very beginning um, when we think about diagnosis and the accessibility and availability of diagnosis for many in our society is still not where it needs to be, both in terms of the length of time people often have to wait, but also in terms of how there is a division uh, often in the ability to access diagnosis. As members will know, I've spoken often and regularly in relation to autism in this parliament, and it still remains the case that adults who seek 
an autism diagnosis are far too often excluded from receiving one and are forced to go private in order to attain one rather than being able to achieve one through the NHS. Now that is changing in Grampian and NHS Grampian are now talking about bringing forward an adult autism diagnos diagnostic pathway which I think is welcome albeit long overdue. But it remains the case that many individuals whose autism may be at the higher functioning end and therefore less likely to present in childhood and adolescence find themselves excluded from the ability to achieve a diagnosis and therefore access the support that is required. And accessibility also relates to support. Often diagnosis uh, can be two things. It can be empowering because it provides you with the opportunity to understand what, what your place is and how, how, th how that affects you. But it can also be incredibly isolating, and that's highlighted, I think, in the, the speech and, the, and the, the amendment from Mark Griffin, that if you don't have ready access or signposting to the support that is available for you out there, you go out into the world alone with that diagnosis, unsure of how to then navigate the system in front of you. And the third area where I think accessibility applies is in relation to transitions uh, and transitions between the different stages of an individual's life as they move through the services that are provided, whether that be from children's services to adult services, adult services to older people's services. Often the transitions are abrupt and are often like a cliff edge for many individuals, with many also finding themselves falling into the gap in between. There also, I think, needs to be greater degree of flexibility applied to people's move through those services, particularly when individuals have social circles that they have developed, but a move to uh, adult or to older people services would break those social circles for those individuals and result potentially in a retreat into loneliness. We also need to think about life chances. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Scotland Fair of Progress report said that while the proportion of university undergraduate entrants reporting themselves as disabled increased, disabled students were less likely than non-disabled students to successfully complete their qualifications. Child Poverty Action Group have highlighted that part of the problem with this is that disabled students face significant difficulties claiming universal credit because the system is exceptionally complicated and often results in students dropping out of courses. I hope that ministers have perhaps had sight of that and may be alive to the concerns that are being raised in relation to it. And I think when we talk about accessibility more, more generally, we need to talk about it in its widest sense. We often talk about accessibility in the physical sense and making buildings and opportunities more physically accessible. But coming at this from the perspective of a parent of an autistic child, I think we also need to think about sensory accessibility uh, as well. When we think about the lighting, about the ambient noise, about the equipment that is often uh, available within venues. Um, as I, I, I will take a short intervention if I have time back for it. Daniel Johnson. I wonder if the member would agree with me that many of those adjustments aren't just good for the people with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, but they're actually good for everyone and therefore should be embraced. Mark McDonald. The member has clearly uh, read the speech I'm about to give, uh, which is quite good because I hadn't. Um, but I agree entirely with this point, and I'll just come back to that. Um, I want to relate my own personal experience. My son, for example, cannot use a communal public toilet because the noise of a hand dryer will send him into a sensory meltdown. So if uh, we are taking him out, we have to use uh, the uh, disabled toilets. Now that can often lead to uh, questioning looks because my son is able-bodied and there still remains a perception out there that these toilets are exclusively for the use of wheelchair users. And with that in mind, and because Ian Gray is not in the chamber, I would highlight and commend the work of his constituent, Grace Warnock, whose campaign to ensure that people have a greater understanding of the uh, wider nature of individuals who require to use these toilets uh, is to be commended. Uh, he's correct, uh, though, Daniel Johnson, in what he says, because none of us are excluded, none of, none of the, the rest of us in society are excluded if we make those adaptations and make those changes to accommodate a wider cohort of individuals. But if we continue to operate on a more narrow basis, we will always exclude those individuals from opportunities that the rest of us uh, take for granted. It's the same in relation to Changing Places Toilets, a campaign which I've been a, a, a vehement supporter of since 2011, when I had the opportunity to shadow a carer in the northeast of Scotland, Stephanie Chalmers, and see the difficulties that she faced in planning day out, uh, days out for herself uh, and her son Connor. It's fair to say that there is a, a range of positive work being done across organisations uh, in the northeast of Scotland uh, and beyond, presiding officer. But too often it remains the case, and as Daniel Johnson has highlighted, that we expect disabled people to adapt themselves 
to the norms of society when what we should be doing and should be focusing on is adapting the norms of society to include disabled people. And I hope that is the spirit in which we will continue to work together to advance and ensure that progress can be made. Bill Kidd, followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this debate, as we know now, because it's been a lot of very good contributions, provides us an opportunity to examine progress made in ensuring that disabled people are afforded the same freedom, choice and dignity as others have a right to expect in Scotland. The Fairer Scotland Action Plan has rightly brought matters of equality and human rights to the forefront of politics on many occasions. Today, two years after the publication of the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan, we're discussing how fair a place Scotland is for disabled people to live in. And the plan outlines five key ambitions and details 93 action points. The five ambitions are centred on support services that promote independent living, choice and opportunity, decent income and fairer working lives, accessible housing and transport, protected rights and active participation in public life. These ambitions, along with the action plans, are to be delivered in this parliamentary session and thereafter, as much as possible in this parliamentary session, we all hope. The trajectory established by this plan is therefore highly important. Underlying the objectives of the plan is what I believe to be one of our key responsibilities as public servants, where we have the ability to promote greater freedom, fairness and equity, it is a prerogative and indeed a responsibility to do so. This is particularly true and even more important when this concerns promoting change for those who face disadvantage. Disabled people will have varied experiences of social barriers according to their individual circumstances and indeed their locality. It's true, however, that the social model of most societies can often exacerbate barriers faced by disabled people. This hinders the full realisation of freedom, fairness and equity. Therefore, it's our duty here to understand these barriers and do what we can now and into the future to address them. Specific barriers face disabled people in Scotland include negative attitudes and lack of awareness, inaccessible buildings, transport and communication, poverty arising from cuts to benefits, social care charges, extra costs and discrimination by employers, services that do not empower their users and lack of information and power to make their voices heard. We Step Together is a learning disability charity based in my constituency and they cite isolation, bullying and harassment as issues faced by disabled people and they've actively combated that over the charity's 22 years of service. The barriers stopping disabled people from living with freedom, fairness and equity are not inevitable. This is something that disability charities have emphasised. Since the publication of the Scottish Government's Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan, a number of steps have been taken to address these barriers. Significantly, a large emphasis of the steps is to ensure that disabled people are listened to and are able to contribute to the changes being made. Accordingly, the Scottish Government has funded the creation of the People-Led Policy Panel run by Inclusion Scotland. This panel is made up by of 50 disabled people of different experiences of what it is to be a disabled person in Scotland. And the panel has open dialogue with the Scottish Government and provides feedback on policy proposals. The Glasgow Disability Alliance are also working to ensure that disabled people are able to engage in the participatory budget processes of local authorities. And these steps are only two of many taken to instigate the needed uh, movement in Scotland to become a place where disabled people have full freedom, choice, dignity and control. One particular area of disability rights that I'm interested in is what it is living with full freedom, choice, dignity and control looks like when it comes to a person's ability to be connected into their communities. This interest comes from seeing over the years the good work that has been done in my constituency of Glasgow Anisland through the collaborative work of many charities and community groups. We step together, as I mentioned, as an example. They work to connect people with learning disabilities with charities like DRC Generations, where young people work with their members. They also work with the Yoker Resource Centre to build connections with their group into the wider community. 
The matter of social isolation and loneliness has been mentioned already, but it's experienced by disabled people across Scotland and it needs to be effectively combated. I personally think that having a sense of community can make people more connected and often happier. The Connected Scotland report on tackling isolation highlighted how transport can, as just one example, be used to make it easier for disabled people to build connections in their community. Simple changes like the automatic ban on pavement parking and the continuation of free bus travel for disabled people are examples of effective and simple steps that can straight away change a disabled person's opportunity to connect with their friends and neighbours. The Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities state the inherent dignity and worth and equal and inalienable rights of all people, and that is the foundation of freedom justice and peace in the world. As policy creators, we here have the ability to take this forward for disabled people in Scotland. Let's reaffirm today our commitment to doing just that. And thank you very much. Tom Mason, followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, maybe I should declare an interest as technically I am disabled. However, in the context of this chamber, I'm quite able to participate in this debate. My point, presiding officer, is that physical disabilities can be often mitigated given some technology and supportive care from others. In fact, given the right circumstances, we can mitigate shortcomings and produce abilities that cast disadvantage into insignificance. Professor Stephen Hawking being a classic example of achieving so much despite a devastating condition. Now, there is a lot of good going on amid some real challenges. We have issues in making sure that disabled people can get into work with, with employment rate that is significantly behind that of non-disabled people at 45.4%. There are challenges in housing as well, with nearly half of adults in social rented house, housing reporting to have a disability, and a waiting list of over 100,000 dis disabled people for housing in 2018, compared with 61,000 three years ago. This is a worrying trend that needs to be addressed immediately. With that said, I referred earlier to good work being done. That is only fair to discuss that as well. Both the UK and Scottish governments run, to, can run back to work schemes for dis disabled people, with participating rates of 75% and 55% respectively. The UK government has also raised the workshop disability support grant to almost £60,000, which is a great step for getting disabled people into workforce. Additionally, the Scottish Government Fairer Scotland plan is comprehensive in its aims, but it is important to monitor progress here. For our part, sorry, in addition, I imagine, my, like my member, many members, I take part in UK Government's Disability Confident Employable Scheme, which I understand is around 11,000 businesses signed up, and I hope this continues to grow in the future. However, I do think that an extra consideration should be given to the fact that dis disability is not always physical, but can be mental as well. In such cases, the sufferer might, might not understand their situation and may not be able to in innovate circumstance or mitigate daily problems. Not least, there can be less understanding of the effect that that disability is having on others. And we see that the employment rate for people with learning dis dis disabilities currently at a mere of 7%. It is clear a situation like this that can bring forward very different challenges. For, for example, I'm thinking here of people on the severe end of the autistic spectrum. This is devastating not only for the individual, but also for parents, siblings and families, doing their best as carers. Caring for such individuals is hugely complex, and it would appear that our health services are currently limited in their ability to take a holistic view of the needs of these autistic patients and supportive parents and families. An example of this is one of my constituents, Jackson. He will be 10 years old in two weeks' time. Jackson is severely autistic, has severe learning difficulties, and is non-verbal. He's now becoming a strapping lad, quite powerful, and with frustration he faces, sometimes quite aggressive and violent. He cannot be left alone for any time as there is a potential danger to himself and maybe to others. Jackson requires a safety bed to keep him secure at night, 
This bed is apparently not available for behavioural issues, leaving the entire family at risk during the night. With his growing size and frustration, his school is struggling to cope. Speech therapists are not making much progress. And with all the attention focused on Jackson, this has a knock-on effect on his siblings. To quote his mother, I am trying to do my best for my son, to ensure that he has a good and happy and safe life. But I continue to have to chase around to speak to people in departments that don't seem to be able to help me or point me in the right direction for help for Jackson. In fact, I have to fight for everything for my son. Where is the diversity and inclusiveness for Jackson? Presiding over his family like Jackson should not have to go through such trauma. We should be able to organise our services to respond effectively. With the right support, families can cope with such disadvantages. While I'm sure each department means well and operates correctly within its brief, such families deserve better than, than being passed pillar to post around departments to little or no effect. These frustrations add to the already huge stresses already experienced by these families. I would ask the Minister today to review how services are co coordinated for young people with similar learning difficulties. And in many cases, the present situation is not working. I would welcome such commitment from the Minister in, in summing up at the end. For the Zadi Office, we welcome these opportunities to strengthen the rights of disabled people in our country. And this debate, I think, shows the commitment across the Chamber. So, we, so as we look forward to the challenges ahead of us, I hope that we will all commit to working together to ensure that people with disability in Scotland enjoy exactly the same opportunities as those without. Thank you. Bob Doris, followed by Mary Fee. Uh, presiding officer, it's a privilege to speak in the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan debate here this afternoon. Now, actually, I bumped into the Glasgow Disability Alliance this lunchtime. Uh, they were taking part in a parliamentary tour with members of the Connected Milton group who'd enjoyed First Minister's questions earlier. At least when I met them, they told me they enjoyed First Minister's questions. I hope that was, I hope that was true. But it was a fortuitous meeting because um, MSPs have received several high-quality briefings ahead of this afternoon's debate, and they've been deeply helpful. So after a meeting, I did go back and I reread the submission uh, just recently by Glasgow Disability Alliance and found it both powerful and compelling. Um, the Glasgow Disability Alliance, for those who don't know, is the largest grassroots pe disabled people-led organisation in Europe, with over 4,500 members across Greater Glasgow. Through accessible programmes of learning, capacity building, peer support and participation, they bring together disabled people and those with long-term conditions to build their confidence, their connections, and support them to make their contributions, to have their voices heard, tackle barriers, and work with others towards equality. And they've got a track record, presiding officer. Glasgow Disability Alliance members helped to shape and launch the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan itself, and have contributed to implementation through input to the employability strategy social security development, including the charter and the experience panels. And there are others I could go on, but I won't because of time constraints. But crucially, at a local level, and this is really is crucial, it, the GDA continues to drive partnership work to progress disabled people's rights and improve outcomes in Glasgow. I suppose that's a crucial part of their submission, actually, because they want to see the delivery plan as a framework document, but they also want to drive local change and local action. They want to see it delivered, not just a framework for delivery. And they've got a key ask. They, they advocate the requirement to establish regional uh, uh, Fairer Scotland uh, for disabled people delivery plans that are re regional ones in co-production with disabled people in each local authority area. And I think that's a, a, a reasonable ask. And they've got some good examples of co-production, it has to be said. Um, they, they, they talk about that partnership work. So Glasgow City Council and the GDA uh, partnership, the rights now, welfare rights protect to help mitigate impacts of universal credit for disabled people in Glasgow, something that's happening now. Local work to reduce the disability employment gap and boost employer ability, and they give examples of that. And also examples around opportunities at the 2018 European Championships and work around hate crime partnerships in local areas facilitated by community safety. So that's not just talking about uh, action for those living with disabilities. It's delivering on that. So they're right to ask, I think, how such local progress is going to be captured within the national plan, uh, how it's going to be shared, and how we're going to drive that progress, how we're going to champion it, 
and how we're going to monitor the extent to which it happens across all local authority areas. Regional and local monitoring and potential targets could be a powerful tool, and there are some very reasonable requests there. Um, now, there are positives. I start off with a negative figure that we've all mentioned, and that is the, the, the employment uh, gap, the, the, the employment rate is half that. Um, of or, or, uh, if, if you live with a, a disability and they the, the plan to half that gap again and to improve the, the, the employment rate of disabled people is a hugely ambitious plan and there's been talk about these are warm words but there is actually some concrete actions that should be some of those concrete actions on record here this afternoon we should mention the fair start scotland uh, fund which is a new employment support service which helps people live, living in Scotland to find work with dignity and respect at its core. Participation in Fair Start Scotland is voluntary, that's crucial, meaning people can choose to take part without fear of affecting existing benefits, absolutely crucial. And Fair Start Scotland is funded by the Scottish Government with Scottish Ministers committing an additional £20 million over and above UK Government funding in each year of Parliament, committing £96 million overall. That's concrete action, it has to be said. I could mention concrete action in terms of the keys to life, um, self-directed support in relation to independent living fund, but for time constraints, I won't. And of course, if I didn't mention, and this is crucial, presiding officer, uh, the different approach that the Scottish Government is taking with the new social security powers in relation to replacements for PIP and DLA, my constituents would say, why did you not raise your voice to see the good things that are happening and to condemn the things that are simply unacceptable, unacceptable in the current system? So I put that yeah, yeah. on the record. My constituents also wouldn't forgive me if I didn't say that uh, Remploy used to be in my constituency and shame on the UK governments that closed that in my constituency. An amazing, wonderful, wonderful, yeah. inspirational, supported workplace. But I do want to say something positive in relation to the UK government in relation to this, and it relates to Sarah Newton, because I also have the Blindcraft, the RSBI, in my constituency, working closely with city building, and unions came to me very worried that the Protected Places scheme was going to put that in huge financial difficulty. I mean, 107 visually impaired workers could be at threat of losing their jobs. Vitally important in my constituency. Well, actually, we work very closely with Sarah Newton, and she secured a two-year extension to that in partnership with the Scottish Government and work that we did locally. And let me just finish in a quote from a UK Government Minister, and this was Sarah Newton, who is a sad loss. We are committed to ensuring that disabled people have the necessary support to thrive in the workplace and protect the places plays a big part in helping thousands to reach their full potential. But right now we don't have a UK disability. Disability Minister, and I would hope the Scottish Government would consider getting the reassurances that Sarah Newton was able to give to my constituents to make sure when they do eventually get a new minister, that endures. It's been a pleasure to speak in this debate. Mary Fee, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I want to use my time today, Presiding Officer, to talk about the lived experience of families who live with disabilities. And I want to begin with a fact. The average public toilet floor has, on average, 77,000 germs and viruses. So let me ask everyone in the chamber today, would you be content to lie on that public toilet floor? Because sadly, that's the only option available to many disabled children and adults when they leave their home. And according to the brand Firefly, which is a disabled equipment manufacturer, 86% of parent carers stated that they have to leave a venue because of inadequate accessible toilet facilities for their loved ones. And the traditionally known disabled toilet is only suitable for those who are able to transfer themselves from their wheelchair to the toilet and back again or for those who can transfer with minimal assistance. Both disabled children and adults with continence issues who require vital support from carers need more space. And research commissioned by MENCAP for the Scottish Government has indicated that there are in the region of 20,000 people living in Scotland who would directly benefit from the use of a changing places toilet. And fully accessible toilets, commonly known as changing places toilets, provide more space for a carer, 
for their wheelchair, a changing bench and a hoist. And lifting a disabled child or an adult compromises the health and safety <coughs> of both the disabled person and their carer. And a hoist can safely transfer the person onto the changing bench or toilet. And to date in Scotland, there are 190 changing places toilets. And for any member who is not aware, a changing places toilet is located in the garden lobby of the parliament. And members across the chamber may be surprised to realise that on our road network across Scotland, there are two, two changing places toilets. And unfortunately, <clears throat> the law is confusing. The Equalities Act 2010 states, whilst it is not compulsory for a business to install a changing places toilet, they do have a duty to make reasonable adjustments to ensure that those with disabilities can access toilets. But the definition of what is reasonable has been left to campaigners. And organisations such as PAMIS have worked with my colleague Jeremy Balfour, MSP, to try to make changes in the regulations through the planning bill. And as Christina McKelvey said in her opening remarks, the Scottish Government is currently consulting on the provision of changing places toilets, and to date there have been over 900 responses. And the consultation closes on the 13th of May, and I would encourage everyone in the Chamber to respond to that consultation. And, Presiding Officer, campaigners are more than aware that not every business can provide these facilities. However, it's not unreasonable to ask larger businesses and larger public buildings to provide fully accessible toilets. Yes, briefly, yes. Half Jeremy time. Balfour. Uh, and thank, uh, I thank the member for giving way. And can I also acknowledge all the work which she has done um, so far. Would she acknowledge that actually there's an economic benefit to businesses as well that have change in place toilets? Because families can stay longer to place, they can spend more money, and they're more likely to go there if there is that kind of facility. Mary Fee. Thank Jeremy Balfour for that um, intervention. And I absolutely agree. Um, Installing changing places toilets, particularly in our cinemas and our shopping centres and in our theme parks, would encourage families to come out and would be beneficial to the, to the businesses. Campaigner Lorna Fillingham states, inclusion means much more than building ramps. If we are going to have an inclusive society, at least build toilets that everyone can use. We also have to take into consideration that disabled children become disabled adults. And Fiona is a carer to her brother Ewan, and they live in the Highlands. And Fiona has told me that Ewan is a 34-year-old man with profound and multiple learning difficulties, who, like most people his age, enjoys living life to the full. Together, we participate in lots of different activities, both within our local community and further afield. Ewan is unable to use a standard accessible toilet, so over the years, in order for him to be able to do the things that he enjoys, we have to develop all kinds of ways of trying to meet his personal care needs. Very briefly, because I'm fast running It will be very brief, brief, because I'm hoping that you will be able to take the opportunity, Mary Field will be able to take the opportunity, presiding officer, in order to welcome the new second generation mobile Pammy Lou, which I believe will have its stomping ground as the Highling, Highlands. Yes, and give I, you another I, I, absolutely, seconds, um, I absolutely welcome that. But, but as, the, as my campaign, campaigner has said to me, that sometimes they have no choice but to abandon what they're doing and drive home. And living in the Highlands, that, that can be quite um, difficult. And it's not dignified. Um, and it's difficult for them to put into words the difference that a change in places toilet would make. But it would be massive, a change in places toilet, in, in, their, in their lives. And it's important for all the family to be able to join in living life to the full. And not being able to participate in society due to lack of facilities does severely impact on the mental health of the disabled person, the carer, and for their family. And, presiding officer, as I finish, can I leave you with a few quotes from Laura Rutherford, who is mum to seven-year-old Brody from Falkirk. No one chooses to have a disability. It can happen to any one of us at any time of our lives. Is it unreasonable to ask for all of our citizens to feel included? 
Is it unreasonable to ask that all our citizens be treated with dignity? And finally, presiding officer, is it reasonable that we even have to debate this in 2019? Thank you. At tight timings, please, from Alexander Stewart and then Richard Lyle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to take part in today's debate, progressing towards a fairer Scotland for disabled people. Disabled people contribute to our communities and our society. There is no doubt about that. And we've heard today some very passionate comments made by members about their own constituencies, their own families, and their own lifestyles as to how disabled uh, and disabilities have affected them. We have come some way, but we have to assure that there's further for us to go. Uh, government, employers and communities must all play their part uh, to ensure that people with a disability are supported. Now, prior to me becoming an MSP, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I spent nearly two decades uh, working for and with individuals with learning disabilities and difficulties. And during that time, it was a real uh, revelation to me to see the constant struggles that many had to endure in their everyday lives. Indeed, uh, my previous involvement and experience gave me the opportunity to uh, be invited to open the Making Where We Live Better conference in 2017, which was organised by my former council in Perth and Kinross. I was also able to recall my experiences and knowledge of private landlords, local authorities and employers in many parts of Scotland who currently are operating practices that are not fully aware and are dealing with individuals uh, with disabilities and not supporting them enough. As my colleague Jeremy Balfour indicated, you know, this is a vitally important debate. Uh, you know, the, the fair value that we have seen, uh, we've gone some way, but people just want a normal job, not a job that's been created for them. They want to be mainstream. They want accessibility to workplaces. They want accessibility to homes uh, and environments. They want a chance to deliver uh, and, and a chance to be part of that. And as Jackie Bailey uh, has said, uh, she's not in the uh, chamber at present, she talked about uh, giving people chances to unlock their potential uh, and Mary Fee made a very passionate speech there about the, the difficulties that individuals face uh, when they're using in toilet facilities. Now these are basics and these are normal circumstances and individuals we should be supporting them through all of that process Deputy Presiding Officer. So it's vitally important that we acknowledge because all these individuals all they want to do is lead independent and normal lives. And as a result of that, uh, I, I believe, you know, uh, that it's vitally important that we look at uh, all aspects of life to ensure that we're supporting individuals. And this is why I would pay tribute to many independent groups and charities across my own region of Mid-Scotland and Fife, and also across Scotland, who are doing outstanding work uh, ensuring that there's a the contribution uh, to ensure that individuals are getting that support and are getting uh, the opportunities to unlock their potential. You know, we've had lots of uh, reports that have come through for the last few days from organisations, and I would talk about what Enable Scotland said. Uh, a fairer society begins with fair fairness and equality in schools where every pupil is supported to achieve and thrive in a truly inclusive environment. That is fundamental and we, we learn that only 7% of people with a learning disability are in paid employment and that Deputy Presiding Officer has to change. A vital building block for a fair society uh, is about the provision of excellent and high quality self-determined social care support. Enable Scotland also talked about the, what, what they see is, is an achievable social care infrastructure which supports people with disabilities to live the life they choose uh, and depends on the recruitment, the training and the retention of staff to support them through that. And there are also opportunities for flexible working to ensure that careers and opportunities are there. And the Scottish Government has already talked about their fair work agenda. Yes, we must have a fair work agenda, but that agenda must be uh, to support individuals with difficulties uh, and disabilities. The Scottish Conservatives very much support increased diversity and fairness in the workplace. I agree with the, the strong that barriers need to be taken down so that people can live in, in adapted homes. 
Uh, and, and we go back to the, the Disability Act of 1995, which came under the Conservative government, and they went some way uh, to, to deal with reasonable adjustments uh, in, in, to ensure that employers uh, uh, were giving that opportunity. And we find ourselves uh, now halfway through the five-year action plan, which was launched in 2016. Uh, and employment rates at that time, uh, when we started, were at 42%, which meant that 58% of individuals did not have the opportunity to work. Uh, a report back in November 2018 found that working women still experience a gender pay gap and the harassment uh, that they can deal with. But disabled individuals uh, uh, found themselves in, in, in a poorer opportunity of, of getting that job. And indeed the report states that disabled people were less likely to be uh, involved in an education course or receiving some kind of job training. So it's vitally important that we tackle that and we look at that as a way going forward. Disabled people are still less likely to be employed and more likely to be unemployed. Women are still likely to be more employed than men in part-time work. So that is all still going on. And whilst we need to look at education, employment and training, uh, young people are twice as likely not to be in education, uh, education training uh, who are disabled. Now that, once again, Deputy Presiding Officer, is something that we cannot continue to see. And finally, I, I would state uh, that many disabled people live in homes that do not meet the requirements that they require to live independently. Many homes, get, when they get to a home, it hasn't been adapted for them. The adaption has to happen after. Uh, so, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's been a pleasure to take part in this debate this afternoon. What we want to see is that we give people the chance, and that they get that chance. It's what they can do and not what they can't do. Thank you very much indeed. The last of the open debate contributions is from Richard Lyle, and I would appreciate under six minutes. Under six minutes, five minutes, she said. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this uh, opportunity to debate on progressing towards a fairer Scotland for disabled people. For me, today's debate touches on the most crucial aspect of the debate of, on our country and its future. What type of Scotland do we wish to shape and mould? What type of Scotland do I want my grandchildren to grow up in? And the answer to that question is clear, President Officer. One where everyone has their equal rights, and then and only then will we have shaped that fairer Scotland. I'm proud to represent a party which recognises absolutely the true valuable contribution that people with disabilities make to Scottish society and Scotland as a whole. And it's important to note this fact and declare it loudly. Over a million disabled people contribute to Scotland's communities and add talent, diversity, and riches to our society each and every day. Our shared goal is for every one of the million disabled people in Scotland to have choice, control, dignity, and freedom to live the life they choose with the support they need to do so. This forms just a part of the Scottish Government's wider efforts to create a stronger economy by focusing strongly on tackling inequality and creating an environment for growth to thrive. Of course, with disabled people making up 20% of our population, it is crucial that we take steps to address negative attitudes which are still so prevalent and which directly contribute to the inequality faced by disabled people. Negative at at attitudes which firmly belong in history, presiding officer. Time and time again, the contribution I see our communities, to our communities by these with the disabilities is immense and incredibly valuable and I wish to pay tribute to local work that I am aware of in this respect. NL Industries is a supported business previously established by North Lancashire Council. The definition of a supported business is a factory uh, business where 50% of the employees are disabled persons who, by a reason, by the nature to severity of their disability, face challenging barriers to take up work in the open labour market. NLI provides a wide range of products and services across the marketplace with customers consisting of both public sector organisations as well as private sector organisations. Supporting employment service assists people with learning disabilities, mental health issues, acquired brain injury, to gain employment and offer practical support to the employee and the employer. This, of course, is just one of the many practical examples of the important contribution which has been made by those with disabilities on employment in Scotland. 
These practical examples are set against a policy backdrop with our Disability Action Plan produced by the Scottish Government with a commitment to principles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The Action Plan covers the period 2016-2021 and aims to make equality of opportunity, access to services, independent living a reality for all disabled people in Scotland. This delivery plan is based on the social model of disability, unlike the medical model where an individual is understood to be dis uh, disabled by their impairment. The social model views disability as a relationship between the individual and society. The delivery plan recognises human rights of disabled people must un underpin all our activity across a whole range of policy and legislation. And it is Important that the plan is shaped by the experience of disabled people and the insights of disabled people organisations. Crucial, crucial to our ambition is the consultation, engagement, and development of policy. It is that engagement so important the effective solutions to the problems and barri barriers faced by disabled people must be drawn from those who lived the experience. President Officer, I am proud of the record of this government. Whilst re reflecting on the positive work of the government, it does have to be said that it's a tale of two governments. The UK government, welfare cuts having a serious impact. The Scottish government already taking up, responding to handful UK government policies. I could go on and on, but unfortunately I don't have the time. As we move forward against the backdrop, we see the creation of Scotland's first social security system, establishing a distinct system with dignity, fairness, respect at its heart. Presiding officer, these actions, our delivery plan, the of work being done by our ministers, by this SNP government, are paving the way towards a fairer Scotland, and I welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lyle. We move to the closing speeches. Uh, disappointing to note that not all members who contributed are back in the chamber, and I call Daniel Johnson. No more than six minutes, please. Okay, thank you, presiding officer. And they're, they're missing out on a treat. Um, but I'd like to begin by reflecting... <laughs> Uh, a, a, a little bit on, on George Adams' point. And, uh, 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 and uh, he began his uh, uh, comments by saying that he felt something of a fraud uh, discussing uh, the disabilities because they were, they were those of his wife. And I think there's something uh, that I was wanting to reflect at the beginning of my speech is I think we must all embrace disability and whether there are disabilities that we may have that we might not feel are, are, we have earned the right to describe as disabilities or those are disabilities of those of, uh, uh, of who are members of our family. I think what's really important is that we have the, the courage to talk about it because I think it's really important because the fundamental thing, and I think if there's one comment that I think has uh, been uh, agreed across the chamber is that this is something that we need to have a greater acceptance uh, in terms of discussing so that we can look at the issues and resolve them. And that's very much been my experience as, as I've um, discussed in the chamber before. I, I have ADHD and I have to say, I've been very reticent um, to describe that as a disability up until, I have to say, when Jeremy Balfour approached me in the garden lobby uh, about nine months ago and asked me if I'd notified Parliament of that as being a disability. And I had to say, I said, I wasn't sure if I should or I could or whether it was justified. And Jeremy told me that I absolutely had to because unless people do stand up and acknowledge their disabilities and talk openly about them as a disability, we, we can't really make progress. And likewise, I had a more recent conversation with uh, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy, who just told me to own it. Because we have to create that understanding, and the only way we will do is if people stand up and talk about their experience of disability, whether it's their own or those around them. And I think that's especially true for invisible disabilities. And I think in particular, people with neurodevelopmental disorders and mental health conditions and learning disabilities, that disability, in some ways, people feel that they haven't earned it because it isn't obvious and it isn't visible. But those are very much disabilities. And I guess that the real litmus test for me was if, if somebody approached me and asked me if they had one of those conditions, do they have a disability? Do they have rights under the Disability at Work Act? I would say absolutely you do, and you must fight for those rights. And I think that was the point. So, uh, on that point, I think this does start in the workplace. And I think there is uh, very often for, for people with invisible disabilities an anxiety about disclosure. Should they disclose and how will that be received? And I think part of that, I think Mary Fee touched on, albeit on a different context, about reasonable adjustments. It's a very oblique, opaque term, one that doesn't 
often uh, get defined and people don't know, it gets treated as a black box. And I think we need to break that down. Now, I'd like to commend in particular uh, the National Autistic Society in Scotland, SAMH and the ADHD Coalition in Scotland, each of whom have uh, produced excellent guides which step out, uh, 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 set out step-by-step -step simple steps that can be taken to help people with autism, mental health conditions and ADHD work. These simple things, many of the things which Mark MacDonald uh, highlighted on, whether it's lighting, making things explicit in the workplace rather than just implied, thinking about noise, clutter in the work environment. And this was the point I was attempting to make in my intervention. Those aren't just things that help people with neurodevelopmental disorders. That just sounds like a good workplace for everyone. So what we need is dialogue. We need understanding. And whether people regard themselves as having disability or not, that ability to talk about the requirements you have at work, what will enable you to do your best work, is something that everyone needs whether you have a disability or not, but is particularly needed for people with disabilities. So just commenting on some of the other uh, issues raised, I, I would just like to briefly mention uh, the, 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 the comments made by Alex Cole Hamilton, and I think especially as somebody who has the Royal Edinburgh Hospital in their constituency, I think that, that comment about the voice and making sure that we include those who are uh, directly affected in the policy making is absolutely vital. And I think certainly it's a frustration of those uh, with, uh, ranging with, from conditions with autism through to profound psychiatric conditions. We must include them. And I do hope that the commitments given by the government are acted on in terms of that. But there are fundamental equality issues and we need a frankness and an unflinching approach as we talk about those. Andy Whiteman was absolutely right to talk and highlight the issues around the poverty gap that exists between those with disability and those who do not in society and the workplace. And many speakers spoke about the invidious and, 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 and really uh, deeply unfair approach by the, the Tory government, and they are right to do so. But we must also look at the decisions and policy uh, uh, that have been made closer to home. Just recently in my constituency, in one of my special schools, they were describing to me a very real anxiety that there are simply not going to be the support places available to the school leavers for this year, the first time they have ever had that worry. And the reality of that is the decisions made in here in the Scottish Government budgets and the impacts they have on local government and the ability to provide those vital services for people with profound support needs as they uh, become adults. Um, and, I, and I think, likewise, I think both Mark Griffin and Jackie Bailey were absolutely right to say that, that, that we need more than just simply a, a, a better approach and the right language. We need, we need genuine ambition and implementation. We, we need to ask ourselves, could we be do better? Is it right that we are leaving the disability benefits with the Tory government until 2024? Is it right that we have so many unfilled posts that were so vital to the uh, key to life strategy? We must do better. But, and I would just, just finally like to name check in my closing moments. Uh, my, I think the, the, the additional support needs point in education is an absolutely vital one. The fact that a third of the respondents to the not included not uh, uh, engaged, not involved, described that they'd been informally and therefore illegally excluded is absolutely appalling because it starts with education and that cannot be allowed in modern day Scotland. Thank you. Michelle Ballantyne, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be able to close the Scottish Conservatives tonight on this, and we will be supporting all the, the motion and the amendments tonight, because I think everything contributes to the discussion we're having. Um, and it is clear from the contribution in this debate that we are and need to continue moving past warm words and drive action that makes a real difference for disabled people. And I do want to echo what Daniel Johnson just said. We do need to own it, because all of us can probably identify either in ourselves or in people we know and love a disability that affects their everyday life. It's been echoed around this chamber today that the opportunity to work is vitally important for so many disabled people. And I welcome the Minister's comments that 3,000 disabled individuals were benefiting from modern apprenticeship last year and that internship is being expanded. But a situation where the disability employment gap stands at 35% is clearly one we still need to tackle. Jeremy Balfour captured the views of, the disa of disabled people in the words of one disabled lady. I just want a normal job, not a job that was created for me. 
I think that is really where we need to be going. And we know that many employers are happy to engage with employing disabled people. And we need to ensure that the access they have for support and help in allowing that to happen and making sure it is meaningful and not tokenistic is really important. And that actually led to the conversation that several people have mentioned, um, Oliver Mandel and Alex Stewart, and picked up again by Daniel Johnson, that actually Affair Scotland for Disabled People does start with the right support and education early on. Um, and that does lead us to the presumption of mainstreaming that was developed to provide a choice for all children to attend a mainstream school. However, increasingly parents and youngsters are struggling to access the specialist support and education that can be so vital in developing the life skills that will allow them to cope and compete in the adult world. So I do think it is important that we revisit the presumption of mainstreaming if we're serious about ensuring that disabled people have a level playing field at the start of their working life. Mark McDonald, uh, Daniel again, and Tom Mason spoke about some of the difficulties that autism can cause and the impact of transition. And uh, I totally agree that actually sensory adjustments to our world, whether it be in our working environment, whether it's in our schools, whether it's in our public buildings, is important to everybody. It can make a real difference to the well-being and quality of everybody's life, not just those who have recognised disabilities. Tom Mason's description of Jason's family experiences echoes that of one of my own constituents, who at 28, with complex disabilities, has struggled to get adequate support from the local authority, and as a consequence, has spent years pretty much confined to a single empty room with minimal um, facilities. He hasn't had a shower or a bath for two years. Now, in this modern age, I think that is utterly unacceptable. And I think we have to provide suitable conditions, suitable housing, for, for particularly for people with complex disabled needs, because the impact on them as individuals and their wider family is significant. And it is just not acceptable that we're in that position. On, on that, Bill Kidd highlighted the inclusion panels and the fantastic work they're doing is to help us understand the needs of disabled people. But I, I think we have to remember around us, we have lots of people with experience and we need to be listening all the time. I, I spend a lot of time listening to what Jeremy has to say, Jeremy, you know, my colleague um, Jeremy Balfour, because sometimes it's the little things, it's the simple things that we forget. And Mary Fee's comment about you know, 77,000 germs and viruses on a public toilet floor. She told me that yesterday and it sat with me all night. Um, and I must admit, I went into the public toilet today and thought, ooh, <laughs> you know. And uh, we laughingly discussed yesterday whether we should test um, the parliamentary facilities because we do basically have good access facilities in parliament. Um, and we should be a leader, because if we're not a leader, then what example are we really setting? But we still only have one changing place toilet. And George Adams highlighted that on their benches there is still a lack of disabled people. I'm glad to say over here we're fairly well represented. But I think when we hear statistics like in only 190 changing places toilets in Scotland and only two of them on the road network, we've got to ask ourselves, are we really focusing on the important things? I think as we look at it, particularly though, um, disabled people in Scotland have been faced with an ever-growing plethora of services that have made it very confusing. And our amendment today is really about saying, OK, we've got lots of things happening, lots of good things happening, but we need to bring them together. We need to have conversations that mean it's easy for us to monitor, to access for disabled people, to be able to go online or to talk to people and quickly and easily get answers and, and get... Um, access to the things they need. So I do hope we will get the support tonight, um, and not just support in, in our amendment tonight, but support in taking that forward and making it a reality. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton did reference his own experiences of the gulf between rhetoric and action, and echoed the need for us to set politics aside to solve some of these problems that people face. And there was a lot of commentary around housing, and I particularly would like us to see, see us do better around housing. But all made reference to the fact that disabled parents do not want a paternal government. They want to be empowered to work, play, and engage with society on an equal playing field. They want us to remove the barriers that allow 
people to participate on an equal footing. Disabled people just want to be treated like everyone else. So in conclusion, no, could you conclude, officer, please? there is an opportunity for the Scottish, uh, Scotland to become a wor real world leader here. And I think if we put our heads together, we can get there. Thank you. Uh, and I call Jamie Hepburn to close this debate. Uh, seven minutes would be most useful if you could please. Thank you very time. much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, begin by thanking uh, members for the contributions that they have uh, made today? I think what we have seen today is a, a broad sweep of consensus uh, across uh, the matters that we have uh, discussed uh, today. There have been a, a variety of issues raised, which I, I would like to address inevitably. I'll not be able to address every issue that's been raised over the course of the debate, but I do want to, to try and, and touch on, on a few. And let me begin with uh, Jeremy Balfour's remarks. It does allow me to place on record we will be uh, supporting the Conservative uh, amendment uh, this evening. He started off his uh, premise was, of course, there have been improvements in the law over uh, a number of years in respect to the rights of disabled people. That's uh, undeniably the case. But what we sadly see is that the improvements to the law have not led to substantial enough improvements in outcomes. And that has to be the starting premise, the reason why we are having this uh, debate this evening. He did talk uh, about, uh, he did make uh, reference to another uh, point uh, which I had sympathy with. He talked about the concern that there often is about the creation of jobs for disabled people and um, looking instead to try and ensure that people are enabled through and enabling work environment to be able to work in any particular environment. I agree with that perspective. I would, though, place on record we should still continue to support uh, the support employment model and the many supported businesses that are doing fantastic work across the country. Uh, Dick Lyle uh, mentioned a very positive local example, and Bob Doris spoke of Royal Blindcraft, who I have had the pleasure of visiting in uh, the past, and we as a government will always look to work with and back such uh, enterprises. Uh, there was, uh, uh, very briefly. Michelle Ballantyne. On the subject of, of the Royal Blind, they have increasingly found that it's difficult for youngsters to get a place at the Royal Blind because the cost of it is not being supported by their local authorities. That referral is not being supported. Will you have a look at that and try and, with your colleagues, try and make sure that youngsters who need it do get the ability to go there? Jamie Hepburn. Well, well, I will look at that, although I don't think that was a reference to Royal Blindcraft, which is a, a factory in the north of Glasgow, which is I, I was talking about. But let me crack on with what I was uh, going on to, to say. Uh, there was a, a clear call from Jeremy Balfour. Michelle Ballantyne reiterated that in terms of looking for us to cooperate with the UK government, not letting ideology get in the way. I will, of course, make the point that where we think the UK government is taking the wrong course in relation to its welfare reforms, which have been so damaging, which have harmed uh, disabled people here in Scotland. We all, of course, continue to make that point. But yes, on a practical basis, we will seek to work with the UK government where it, it is it's sensible and necessary to do so. And on this agenda, that is the case. We already do that, for example, through Fair Start Scotland, where we are taking a very different approach to the work programmes that existed uh, beforehand. But we work with the DWP and the Job Centre Plus to deliver that programme on a practical uh, basis. I will say, and I will very much concur with the point that was made by a number of members, our ongoing interaction and cooperation with the UK government will be much more straightforward when the UK government get round to appointing a replacement for Sarah Newton. It cannot be acceptable that the people of England do not have a minister for disabled people right now. And I should place on record, actually, as Bob Doris uh, remarked, I actually found uh, Sarah Newton someone very uh, good to work with. We didn't agree on everything, but she was uh, very good and effective in uh, her uh, role. Uh, Alec Cole Hamilton uh, raised a number of points about uh, the need to consider the opportunity to better embed autonomy and self-determination for disabled people. I absolutely agree we should uh, always be looking to do so. We would have happily accepted his amendment if it had been uh, accepted for debate. What I will, of course, say is the review of mental health legislation and the adults with incapacity legislation gives us an opportunity. We will uh, take that uh, opportunity as uh, we uh, move uh, forward. Uh, Mark Griffin uh, spoke uh, for the Labour Party, opened for the Labour Party and raised uh, a number of issues. I 
want to also place on record we will be accepting the Labour amendment uh, this evening uh, as well. He raised some concerns of disabled people's organisations and disabled people in relation to the action plan. This government strongly believes in co-production. I think Christina McKelvey laid out that we have been engaging, will continue to engage in... Excuse me, Minister, there's a, a low buzz that's just getting louder and louder. If you could stop your private conversations, please. Jamie Hepburn. I thought you were rather charitable in saying it was a low buzz, presiding officer, but that's just my uh, perspective, perhaps. Uh, in re relation to my responsibility for employment, I will continue to meet disabled people's organisations and disabled people, uh, and if any organisation wants to meet me, they just need to let me know. Turning to the issue of employment, the uh, per pervasive nature of the disability employment gap is unacceptable. The point has already been made. We have a 35.8% disability employment gap. That is nothing short of an economic injustice. It cannot be acceptable that here in 2019 we have a disability employment gap of that nature. It leads to uh, people not being socially included. It leads to poor economic outcomes for disabled people. But of course it is also an economic futility. Uh, President Officer, we know right now, I know certainly from the many employers coming forward to speak to me about the skills gaps they have, the vacancies they have uh, in their particular workplace that they cannot overlook any segment of the population. And in that regard, that's why it is not only uh, the moral imperative for us to take action to uh, half, at least half the disability employment gap and seek to go further, it's an economic necessity to do so as well. We have set ourselves an ambitious and reaching target to do so. I've laid that out very clearly to Anne Whiteman. I embrace the leadership role that the Scottish Government has in that regard. It is it's something we will take forward, but it's something that we will need to take forward collectively as a society. It's something that is achievable, and it's something that can be done if we reaffirm our commitment to disabled people tonight, as Bill Kidd suggested that we do. President Officer, our ambition is to build momentum across all of Scotland, across all economic sectors, to increase the number of disabled people meaningfully employed in our economy and meaningfully involved in our society. This will enhance disabled people's equality and right to live independently. We can only realise this ambition when we commit to learning it collectively. And I know that this evening I can rely on Parliament to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And that concludes our debate on uh, Fairer Scotland for Disabled People. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 16611 on First Minister's Questions, Portfolio and General Questions and Topical Questions. Could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And we're going to turn now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 16593.1 in the name of Jeremy Balfour which seeks to amend motion 16593 in the name of Christina McKelvey on progressing towards a fairer Scotland for disabled people be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 16593.3 in the name of Mark Griffin, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Christina McKelvey. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 16593 in the name of Christina McKelvey as amended on progressing towards a fairer Scotland for disabled people be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And our final question is that motion 16611 in the name of Graeme Day on questions be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting. <laughs>